anyway, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn over to the book of Genesis, and uh, uh, let me just say that, hey, I'm learning some cool stuff too, and I hope that you're learning some cool stuff, and I want to thank the, the leadership here for allowing me to come uh, back here. Oh, you need my flash drive? Oh, you're having all kinds of difficult. Uh, it, she has it. My wife has it. Where do you have it, my flash drive? Okay. It's in there. I think it is. Might not have the video. Oh. That's all right. So anyway, I would just want to thank everybody for allowing us to be here. Um, who was the gal that was up on stage? What was her name that talked about her son? What is it? Gina Anderson. Gina Anderson. We actually have a, a, a little girl back in our congregation, or was friends of, of uh, people in our congregation who has leukemia too. And her leukemia, um, she went into remission, and not too long ago, uh, it came back, and they're having all kinds of problems with that. So we, God bless her for sharing her testimony and some of the stuff that she's going through. Um, but uh, thank God that she believes in the Lord. Anyway, um, do you, is it in there? Just keep looking. So uh, while you're the turn in there uh, in Genesis, I want to read an article uh, because we're talking about how the, 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 the dinosaurs um, got extinct. It's the silver plex one, the silver one. Um, most evolutionists believe that some sort of a cataclysmic event such as an asteroid impact killed them all. I don't even know why we have to teach this class if the doc is just explaining everything already. But anyway, I found an article I want to share with you. It was written by a man by the name of Rolf Smith. He wrote this for National Geographic. The article was titled, Here's What Happened to the Dinosaurs. And this is what he said, and this is how it started out. Imagine sunrise on the last day of the Mesozoic era, 66 million years ago. Shafts of sunlight rake through the swamps and forests along the coast of what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Isn't that wild how he would start? How does he know that? Okay. The blood-warm seas of the Gulf Mexico teem with life as this lost world of dinosaurs and outsized insects squawks and buzzes and whirls life. An asteroid the size of a mountain is hurling toward the earth at about 40,000 miles or 64,000 kilometers an hour. For a few fleeting moments, a fireball that appears far bigger and brighter than the sun streaks through the sky. An instant later, the asteroid slams into the earth with an explosive yield estimated at 100 trillion, trillion tons of TNT. The impact penetrates Earth's crust to the depth of several miles, um, making a crater, a crater more than 115 miles, 185 kilometers across, and vaporizing thousands of cubic miles of rock. The event sets off a chain of global catastrophes that wipe out 80% of life on Earth, including most of the dinosaurs. And then it goes on and on, and I'm like, really? You've got to be kidding me. So I did have a picture of where that impact site was. I don't know if we're there yet. We're getting there. Uh, maybe. Nope. Yes, there's actually the impact site, um, so they say. And they did some research and dug up part of the meteor that they said hit that uh, Yucatan part of Mexico in, um, you know, yeah, right, huh? Isn't it crazy? Um, he said this, um, I quote, this is what he says, it was an asteroid impact theory, and but exactly how the fallout killed off so much life on Earth has remained a tantalizing mystery. And then there are those who claim that some dinosaurs evolved into birds. We've heard that before. And thus they are not extinct, but are flying around us even today. And then there's some other theories that I found out that they said also, which was just like what the doc said. Some said they starved to death. Uh, they died from overeating. <laughs> some of us can probably relate to that, right? Feel like that sometimes. <laughs> Uh, they were poisoned. I feel like that. I went to lunch with the staff today, and we ate again. Seems like we're just eating all the time. We ate yesterday, and I think I'm going to go home, and people are not going to recognize me, and they're going to say, you have evolved into something else. Yes. 
Um, they became blind. Listen to this. They also said they became blind from cataracts and could not reproduce. Have you ever heard that one before? Mammals ate their eggs. Other causes include volcanic dust, poisonous gases, comets, sunspots, meteorites, mass suicide. Mass suicide? What, were they all depressed dinosaurs? <laughs> okay. Uh, constipation? Seriously. Parasites, shrinking brain, and greater stupidity. Uh, slipped discs, changes in the composition of air, etc., etc. It's just a bunch of guesses, and they're just a bunch of theories. And you and I look at that, and we just laugh, don't we? But there's actually people who believe in this stuff. And, and that just boggles my mind. And they could just say anything. Um, it is obvious that evolutionists don't know what happened and are grasping at straws. In recent evolutionary book on dinosaurs, A New Look at the Dinosaurs, the author Alan Cherig made this statement. Now comes the important question. What caused all these extinctions at one particular point in time? Approximately 65 million years ago, dozens of reasons have been suggested, some serious, some sensible, others quite crazy, and yet others merely as a joke. Every year, people come up with new theories on the, this thorny problem. The trouble is that if we are to find just one reason to account for them all, it would have to explain the death all at the same time of animals living on land and of animals living in the sea. But in both cases, of only some of those animals, for many of the land dwellers and many of the sea dwellers went on living quite happily into the following period. Alas, no such one explanation exists. That's right. There's no one explanation that they could say, but we know, and we have an explanation, don't we? Sure we do. If we remove the evolutionary framework, get rid of all the millions of years, and then take the Bible seriously, you will find an explanation that fits the facts and makes perfect sense. Okay, um, let's have the next slide. Okay, how many have ever seen pictures like that? Haven't we? You know, those are, you know, for the children and stuff like that. But I will have to tell you this, that when the world looks at the Bible account, this is probably what they have in mind when it comes to Noah's, Noah's Ark and the flood. They see pictures like this, and no wonder they come up with conclusions and say, oh, the Bible is just a bunch of myths. Uh, it really didn't happen. It's more like fairy tales. And some of us have these, these pictures in our minds and they're burned within our brains that that's all we see when we talk about Noah's Ark and the flood, right? I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who believe that. No wonder they don't believe in, in Noah's Ark. Uh, the account of Noah and the Ark is one of the most widely known events in the history of mankind. Unfortunately, like other Bible accounts, it's often taken as mere fairy tales and, and maybe there's some kind of spiritual meaning behind it all. If you have your Bibles, we're in Genesis, the sixth chapter. We're going to breeze through this because we have a lot of Scripture to look at here tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the Scriptures uh, this evening. Uh, but we're going to look at the wickedness of man. And we're in Genesis, the sixth chapter, in verses 1 through 8. And then we'll get, uh, get through this together. So let me just read it to you. This is God's Word. Um, let me just say this. You all need to fall in love with God's word. Okay? Uh, I know sometimes this is probably the heaviest book to pick up and read. If not, you know, maybe your telephone. Uh, but we have the Bible everywhere. And uh, there's no excuse for any of us not to know what the word of God says. I will tell you this, that a long time ago, this was never a part of my life. And then when I became a Christian... Uh, somebody instilled with me the importance and the priority of reading and studying God's word. And for some of us, you know, we just take things for face value as if the minister has the pipeline and all the proof. No, it's your duty to read the scriptures, to study it, and also to share it with your children. And I cannot reiterate that enough. It's a priority. No wonder in our world people are, are they're really starving for something, but they're looking for the answers in so many different directions when the answers are right here, okay? Uh, enough of that. Okay, look at uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 8. 
Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now we could camp out there, but we're not going to camp out there. So that's another study. So ask Rick about what that means, okay? He's a studier. Uh, Verse 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. This is a sad account. For he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil continually. I cannot comprehend that. Where everybody's just thinking about about bad things and about evil things. We say we live in some crazy times, right? And there's a whole lot of evil in this world. But it's not as bad as it was back then. You know how I know that? Because some of you probably sitting here are probably thinking about some good things, right? Yeah, like, when is he going to be done? <laughs> and, and Rick really evolved. Yes. Speaking of evolution, let me just say this real quick. Does anybody ever remember a man by the name of Mike McGinnis, who was our intern a long time ago? We actually found the missing link when he became our intern. Am I right? Anyway, he was our intern just real quick because we used to call him the missing link. Uh, We were playing basketball. It was shirts and skins one time. We didn't know anything about him. He didn't know anything about us. I was playing shirts and he was playing skins. He took off his shirt and we were all like, oh my goodness. Did he not have hair like everywhere and on his back? And we were just like, you're kidding me. And I had to guard the guy. And it was sweaty. Anyway. So anyway, um, let's just go on. So the intent, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man. That must have broke God's heart, okay, on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. He's sorry. Because of sin. Sad. Here he creates man in his own image. And the men that are created in his own image. Are rebelling against God. But there was one man who stood out. And there always is one person who stands out. Seems like right. Uh, In Genesis uh, 6, 9 through 12, Noah pleases God. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Very wicked place. And then in uh, Genesis 6, 13, Uh, The ark, God wants Noah to prepare. He said, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark out of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and it's, it's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and then you shall finish it to a cubic from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower and second and third decks, just like the doc said, three levels. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and every creeping thing on the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you, keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Then Noah did according to all God commanded him. What a great man, right? He obeyed God. In Genesis 6, 5, we see that God realized that something had to be done because of sin. 
There was so much evil in the world. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. Does that sound familiar? It's happening all over the place, folks. Remember what I said a couple of nights ago, or I don't know, it was last night or whatever. You disconnect yourself from God, bad things happen. Read Romans, the first chapter. We read that last night. Mankind was following the way of Satan, who had rebelled against God much earlier. In order to save mankind, God decided to destroy most of mankind and start all over again with just eight people. And he instructed Noah to build this ark. And one of the false ideas about the ark, Noah's ark, is that it was just this simple little boat. Because people are always asking, you know, how can all the animals fit on that boat? I mean, it was just small and what have you. And many attack the story of the Bible and don't realize that the ark was an immense size. It was huge. In Genesis 6, 15, it says, And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. I think I have a picture of the ark. I don't know if you can see that. But you see where the ark is here? Like if you look at the very top one. Uh, there's a picture of the wooden Santa Maria, the wooden uh, Wyoming. You also have the picture of the Titanic there. And then you see the Queen Mary. Okay. So you have Noah's Ark right there. So it was about 500 feet long. You see that? See that picture? Everybody get, gets that? Uh, here's here's uh, some more information. Uh, the Ark measured 30 by 50 by 30 cubits, which is about... 510 by 85 by 51 feet with a volume of, get this, of about 2.21 million cubic feet. Researchers have shown that this is the equivalent volume of over 500 semi-trailers of space. Has anybody been to the Ark Encounter? Oh my goodness, you guys all need to go there. The lady from Nebraska, what is your name back there? Ma'am, who went to the Ark Encounter? Okay. Well, she wait, She raised her hand. I don't know. I thought she was from Nebraska. <laughs> You're all like, there's somebody else from Nebraska? <laughs> I thought it was her. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, the lady from Nebraska right here, my wife, actually from Iowa. But anyway, we took a tour of the Ark Encounter. It's an exact replica of Noah's Ark. It's unbelievable. It's in Kentucky. Um, it's right, uh, it's, how, how far is it from Cincinnati, Ohio? About 45 minutes from Cincinnati, Ohio. You've been there? Have you, ha, he has. It is unbelievable, uh, the Ark Encounter. Let me just show you a picture of that. It is I mean, we took a tour. Actually, we were driving through. I think, we're, where were we going on vacation? Was it back here? No. Uh, no, we were going to the uh, North Carolina, and we wanted to stop there. We actually stopped there when it first opened, and it was uh, late at night, and I think it was open for 24 hours at a time. And so we got there probably about 11 o'clock at night, and I'm thinking, okay, we could just take a quick tour of this thing. <laughs> We drove up and we were like, oh my goodness, this is a huge ship. And then you walk in the place and they have the three levels and they have the animals there, um, which is unbelievable. Uh, I would suggest, what's that? Yes, they did. They had dinosaurs in the ark, which I will show you pictures of, okay? Okay, so how could Noah round up so many animals? That's the common question there. Uh, Genesis six nineteen through 20, And every living thing of all flesh shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be ma male and female of the birds after their kind and animals after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you and keep them alive. 
Genesis 7, uh, 1 through 3 also says this, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that your righteousness before me is in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. Have you ever thought about it? How did those animals walk or, you know, get to the ark? Does anybody ever think about that kind of stuff? Okay. Um, The animals simply arrived at the ark as if called by a homing instinct. Okay. I don't know how God did it. Uh, But when I think of this verse, this is what I always think about. I think about the migrating animals of this world. And I was watching a show not too long ago about the caribous in Alaska. It's unbelievable their migration. Year after year after year after year, they do the same thing. They start in one area, they go about 400 miles, they have their birthing area where they all, within a week, they all have their babies And they hang out there for a week, and then they migrate again. It's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that amazes me that God can do that and has created animals with that kind of instinct. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if we have animals that do that today, you know, with God, all things are possible. Or how about the monarch butterfly? You know, listen to this. You can actually, during the migration of the monarch butterfly, there's an app that you can get on your phone and follow the monarch butterflies in their migration patterns. It is unbelievable. We've actually, I have, but they've all died out. I've actually planted butterfly bushes in our yard so that they stop in our yard. But my sister, who lives in Exira, Iowa, They have a whole slew of trees, and they're part of their migrating patterns. And when they migrate, they all come and roost in their trees. And she always shows us pictures of all these monarch butterflies. And you know what? It happens almost the same time year after year after year after year. Isn't God amazing? So if he can do that with animals now, hey, you know. He can bring those animals to the ark. I think that was pretty impressive, okay? Real quick, uh, were there dinosaurs on the ark? Well, we talked about dinosaurs last night, and according to Genesis, uh, the Bible tells us that the land-dwelling animals were created on what day? Day number six. Therefore, it is clear that dinosaurs being land animals were made with man, which is made on the same day. Also, two of every kind, seven of some of land animals boarded the ark, Nothing indicates that any of the land animal kinds were already extinct before the flood. Besides the description of the behemoth that we talked about last night in Job, the uh, 40th chapter, listen to this. Job lived after the flood. Only fits with something like a sauropod dinosaur. Okay? How did those huge dinosaurs fit on the ark? Well, the ancestor of the behemoth must have been on the ark. Right? True. Okay. Uh, Maybe juveniles, babies. Um, I found this picture. I thought it was pretty cool. Does anybody, uh, to turn it back to the the ark there. Can you see all the animals in that picture? Are there dinosaurs in that picture? (laughs) Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, there must have been ancestors of the behemoth. Maybe juveniles, maybe smaller than that. Uh, God most likely brought Noah two young adult seropods rather than two full-grown ones. Let me just show, you know, just, you know, this is something to speculate and think about. Maybe the same goes for elephants, giraffes, or other animals that grow to be very big. Actually, these are actual pictures from the Ark Encounter. Now, we know this is man's interpretation, right? But there were actually small dinosaurs on the Ark, which I was blown away. It was really cool. So... Okay, Um, how could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? In his book, Noah's Ark, a a feasibility study, creationist John Wood Moorrapper suggests at most 16,000 animals were all 
that were needed to preserve the created kinds that God brought into the ark. The ark did not carry every kind of animal, nor did God command it. It carried only air-breathing, land-dwelling animals, creeping things, and winged animals such as birds. Aquatic life, fish, whales, etc., and many amphibious creatures could have survived in sufficient numbers outside the ark. This cuts down significantly the total number of animals that needed to be on board. Another factor which greatly reduces the space requirements is the fact that the tremendous variety in species we see today did not exist during the days of Noah. You know, like all the different dogs that we have, it wasn't back then, okay? I mean, think about the different species we have, variety of them. Only parent kinds or juvenile kinds of species were required to be on the board in order to repopulate the earth. For example, only two dogs were needed to give rise to all the dog species that exist today. This is where we have to think outside the box, right? So how could a flood destroy every living thing? Turn to Genesis, the seventh chapter, verses 4 through 12. Okay. Genesis 7, 4 through 12. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, on that day, isn't it amazing the detail that God gives us? On that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen, folks, Noah's flood was much more destructive than any 40-day rainstorm could be. I mean, we had rain the other day here, right? And you guys were all blaming it on me. No, you can blame that on God, right? <laughs> and you're all like, oh, John, why? Uh, no, um, you all know what happened in Ellicott City, right? What did that, that happen within a span of two years? Didn't they have one two years earlier? Less than two years? I'll tell you what, I know, you know, when I'm from this area and I hear things from Ellicott City or anything from Maryland, my ears and my eyes perk up because I want to know what's going on. And when that flood went through again, I am like, you've got to be kidding me. Why did they not get it right? I don't know. They still haven't. Uh, what about the devastation from Katrina? I had the opportunity after Katrina hit New Orleans, went on a mission trip with another church, and we went down there uh, a, a few months after uh, the devastation, and we were able to go down there and to tear down homes, restore homes, went to neighborhoods that were totally devastated, and, and they, sh I mean, it's just unbelievable de devastation that took place uh, during that time and the loss of life and how many people lost their life during that flood. And there were people that, that were so depressed because of what had taken place that even people that were trying to help them to recover, it really wasn't good enough. And so a lot of people just left the area. But I remember going to this one man's house and we were helping him to uh, do drywall and what have you. And he had pictures of the flood. And I wish I had them with me on how high the water got above his house. And he said that he had a car that came from about five miles away that was in his front yard. And he had pictures. Okay. So Noah's flood was much more destructive than any 40-day rainstorm ever could be. Remember, it had never rained before. Genesis 2, 5 through 6 says that. Uh, you could read that later. Uh, there was this mist that went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the, the ground. This was the state of the earth until the days of the flood judgment. And it would be twofold on what took place during the flood. Water came from the sky, rain, and from the ground as the Lord caused the huge oceans of subterranean water to burst forth and shoot 
into the surface. Genesis 7, 10 through 12 says, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of flood were on the earth. Like we said, and it gives the day. And it says, On the day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. This is unbelievable. Sometimes we think of the flood and we think, oh, it's just a bunch of water. But there's actually some things that took place uh, when the flood happened. I was reading an article by a man by the name, uh, he's a scientist, and he confirms biblical account of the fountains of the deep. And in his article, it was beginning and end, this is what he said. In yet another confirmation of the Bible's accuracy, scientists have now confirmed what Scripture referred to as the fountains of the deep. In the days of Noah and the ark, these large pools of water beneath the earth's crust burst forth onto the gr- uh, surface, providing the massive amounts of water needed for the global flood judgment. What has been a, a source of skepticism and mockery for those who doubt the Bible has now been confirmed by some secular scientists, again showing that although written over 3,000 years ago, the Bible's description of the earth and its natural properties are indeed accurate. There's a lot of water under the earth. Okay? That's what he went on to say. So, so you have this taking place. There's water coming up. There's water coming down. Uh, let me just say this. There's other scriptures, too, that show this, this, this water from the earth. Uh, when the Lord gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he also referenced the underground water source. Listen to this. From Exodus 24. Um, well, I don't have it here, but uh, you could read that yourself. Um, in Ezekiel 26, in an address of judgment upon the city of Tyre, in the Bible recounts how this island city would be destroyed by water and this divine judgment will come from the deep. So there's other places. To sum it all up, what you have taking place is volcanoes, earthquakes, geysers of molten lava, scalding water were squeezed out of the earth's crust in a violent, explosive upheaval. Okay, let's go back to the, the first picture there. These are pictures from Hawaii recently. My wife and I, we were, had a vacation over there on, on uh, Oahu, and uh, we were there uh, for about a week. Uh, it was a blessing to be there, but while we were there, an earthquake, uh, they have over a thousand earthquakes a year. Isn't that crazy? And then um, the volcano erupted on the big island, and there were people like, are you near that? No, we're not near that. Um, but these are actual pictures of recent things that have happened on the big island of Hawaii. Look at the devastation and look what can happen. This is just one area of the world, okay? How about the next one? How about the tsunami? This is from Japan, what a tsunami can do. When I was stationed in Adak, Alaska, we had a tsunami alert. I didn't even know what a tsunami was at the time, but they said there was an earthquake in Japan and that we had to get to higher ground, which we did go to higher ground, and I'm like, you know, here I am, this young kid, you know, not even 21 years old or what have you, and they're talking about a tsunami, and I didn't even know what it was. But then once I found out what a tsunami was, I never uh, witnessed anything like that before until Indonesia, uh, which we all have, which we all saw, but then also the one not too long ago in Japan. It's unbelievable. And how about this one? The next one. Uh, This is from the earthquake in Haiti. Has anybody ever been in an earthquake before? It's pretty scary, isn't it? I mean, I lived in California and we had earthquakes quite a bit. And there were times where we were woken up and uh, had uh, plenty of earthquakes. And it's a scary thing. Okay. So anyway, um, so all this is taking place and it was it was violent. That's what you got to get into your mind and into your heart. It, it was a violent time that was taking place during the flood. And it didn't stop until 150 days later. So this is all taking place. Just think about all this destruction and took place in the, some of the pictures that I've showed you. Um, and just those are minute compared to uh, the destruction during Noah's time. These local flood volcanoes and earthquakes 
though clearly devastating to life and land, are tiny in comparison to the worldwide catastrophe that destroyed the world back then. So was the flood global? Because there's a lot of people who say, you know what? We think it was just a, you know, a local flood. Okay? Second Peter, third chapter, verses five through six. Here he is talking about the flood, uh, going back and uh, writing about the flood. And he says this, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. All land animals and people not on board the ark were destroyed in the flood waters, and millions of animals were preserved in the great fossil record that we see today. I want you to think about that. Here they board the ark, Noah and his family. The rain starts to come. God shuts the door. What does the Bible say about Noah? While he was building the ark, he was a preacher of righteousness. Right? The whole time, I'm probably sure while he's building the ark, he's probably talking to people about what is going to come. And yet the people did not listen. And every time I think about this, I think about the door being closed on family members and people that you knew and people that you grew up. And once that door was closed, guess what? That door could not open again. Right? Do you kind of get the picture? I mean, we we understand that it was a global flood. It wasn't a local flood. And I'll tell you why, you know, it wasn't. But we kind of get an indication of what took place there. And it wasn't just the animals, but it was people too that died in that flood. Just like people die in floods today. I don't know. Did anybody die in Ellicott City? Yes. That day they woke up like any other day, right? Just going to go about their business. And then there's this flood. And now families are suffering as a result of what took place. Okay. In Genesis 7, 19, we see that the water prevailed high above the earth Notice the way the Bible states it. All the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. How is it possible to try to claim the flood was a local flood when this type of terminology is used? And yet many Christians today claim that the flood of Noah's time was only a local flood. They have accepted the widely believed evolutionary history of the earth, which interprets the fossil layers as the history of the sequential appearance of life over millions of years. Secularists deny the possibility of a worldwide flood at all. Why wouldn't they? Those who accept the evolutionary time frame with its fossil accumulations also rob Adam and Eve of its serious consequences. They put fossils which testify of disease, suffering, and death before Adam and Eve's sin and brought death and suffering into the world. In doing so, they undermine the meaning of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the flood only affected, affected a small area at a time, as some claim, Why did Noah have to build an ark? Right? Most importantly, if the flood were local, people and animals not living in the vicinity of the flood would not have been affected by it. They would have escaped God's judgment of sin. In addition, Jesus believed that the flood killed every person not on the ark. Listen to what he said in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving men marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wow. If the flood were a local flood, Now listen to this. God would have repeatedly broken his promises never to do such a thing again. God put a rainbow in the sky, right, as a covenant between God and man and the animals that he would never repeat such a thing again. Does this all make sense? Okay. 
The Bible is obviously claiming that all the earth was destroyed by water. Many today claim that it is impossible. Okay? But let's notice what the Bible claims about the last days of mankind. Okay? I read an article and I want to share with you, share, share this with you. Then I'm going to show you a short video and then I'm going to show you some things on what we can learn from this whole thing. Okay? This is an article from Ken Hammond uh, entitled Dinosaurs in the Bible because we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what happened to the dinosaurs, right? <laughs> okay? We already said that dinosaurs were on the ark. Okay? But it, here's what he says, uh, which I tend to agree to. He says, those Land animals, including dinosaurs, found the new world to be much different than the one before the flood. Due to, one, competition for food that was no longer in abundance. Uh, Two, other catastrophes. Three, man killing for food and perhaps for fun. Four, the destruction of habitats, etc. Many species of animals eventually died out. The group of animals we know called dinosaurs just happened to die out too. In fact, he goes on to say this. Quite a number of animals become extinct, extinct each year. Extinction seems to be the rule in the earth history, not the formation of new types of animals as you would expect from evolution. Animals, they, they extinct all the time, right? Okay. I want to show you a video, and this is from the Creation Museum. Do we have that? Okay, you're, you're awesome. This is just a video of what possibly happened to the earth during the flood. We don't have it? Okay, Rick, will you come up here and try to explain? And I have another book for you if you want to, just what <laughs> happened. Come on, man, you did so <laughs> Okay, we'll try after the break, okay? Um, Okay, so we'll do that, but let me, just, let me just sum up some things here, okay? There's a lot of lessons that we can learn, right? It wasn't just a picture of a cartoon of Noah and these animals on an ark. There was a lot of devastation, and it was all the result of sin, okay? As she was explaining some of the things that she was going through and what her son went through, all I could think about is the fall, And how we suffer as the result of the fall. Every single one of us. There's not a one of us in here who who loves death. We all hate it, don't we? We do. As a matter of fact, Romans tells us that we all are groaning. All of creation to be redeemed. Okay? But let me just tell you some lessons that we can learn here. And we'll wrap this up. Death is actually an intruder entering when the first man, Adam, disobeyed. It was never meant to be that way. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12 says, therefore, just as through one man's sin, and we've said it before, entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay? We also need to recognize that the wickedness in the world is because of sin, because man rebelled against God. Sin is not a good thing. Right? Now you think about sin, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow, and I'm going to show you all the different sins that are in the Bible. Because a lot of times we kind of lump sin into one word, you know? And I've done this before. We'll say our prayers at night because we want to be forgiven of our sins, and we'll say something like this. God, please forgive me of all the sins that I committed today. Oh, yeah, well, which ones were they? Do you see what I'm saying? It was because of sin that this all happened. We can, all, we, we can also need to, to, to be reminded that God who made all things, including the dinosaurs, is also a judge of his entire creation. He judged Adam's sin by cursing the world with death. Adam was warned about what would happen if he disobeyed God's instruction not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's in Genesis 2, 17. We talked about that. People, animals, including dinosaurs, also remind us that God judged the rebellion in Noah's day by destroying the wicked world with water, resulting in the death of millions of creatures and humans. The Bible teaches us that he will again judge the world, but next time, guess what he's going to do? He's going to do it by fire. 
Okay? Now, there's a lot of people that scoff at that, right? And maybe some of us are sitting here going, you know what? Where is he? Where is God? Well, I'm pretty sure that those people in Ellicott City didn't think that there was going to be a flood that day, too. And some of them lost their lives and perished. Right? I want you to turn over to 2 Peter, the third chapter. Incidentally, I got to tell you about, you know, I, I love the word of God. This Bible right here, uh, just real quick. Um, one day, actually, this is a Bible that I had here in Glen Burnie. Okay, only it didn't look like this. It was really torn up. When I got to the church in, in uh, uh, Council Bluffs, my Bible went missing, and I didn't know where it was. And this is, a, this is my study Bible. I write in it. I, the pages are falling out. There's ripped pages. There's all kinds of stuff. So I was like, I was sad because my Bible was gone. And so what happened is, is somebody had taken my Bible. They took it. They sent it away. They had every page ironed. And they put it in a new, you know, book like this. And then they gave it back to me one day on past, you know, a preacher's appreciation day. And, uh, and I thought, you're kidding me. And, and anyway, anyway, would someone like to read Second Peter, the third chapter uh, and verse 10? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, so the so 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 the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night, right? Here's what I want to say to you guys. He will not come as a thief in the night if you and I are ready. Right? See, if we know a thief is coming to our house, guess what's going to happen? We're going to, what's that? Ching, ching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, we're not coming to your house. Okay? But you know what I mean? We're ready, right? See, this is for everybody that's else that's not ready. But you're a part of the church. These are all lessons for all of us. And we're to be ready. Okay, that's another lesson. Okay, uh, real quick, we can also be reminded that after this judgment by fire, God will make a new heaven and a new earth for us. We get it all back. 2 Peter 3, 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And also that God will wipe away all our tears and there will be no more death, according to Revelation, the 21st chapter and verse 4. But we also need to be reminded that many will not be allowed into heaven and will suffer for eternity. That's what I want you to understand, folks. You see how this is so important? Because a lot of us, we just go about our daily lives, we go to our work, we do this, and we know family members too. But there's going to come a day when it's just going to be like in the days of Noah where the doors are going to be shut and it's going to be over and not everybody makes it, right? People who have sinned have separated themselves from God, but God has provided a wonderful means of deliverance from sin. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, okay?